James and I were talking this morning about, well, I, I, I should say I was talking and then he looked at me and said that was like 10 questions. Uh, but the question that I was asking was, well, isn't it, you know, we're all made of information, um, our DNA. Uh, and uh, uh, I have a sort of personal story about our next uh, uh, conversant. Um, I'm adopted and I found my birth mother, thanks to search uh, in the late 90s, um, search engines. Uh, and uh, I've never been able to find my dad. If you're out there on the live stream, call me. Um, and uh, uh, my father is here, uh, and he's my father, of course. Uh, but I've always been interested, at least in what was the information that was passed down to me from this other dude. Um, and so uh, I finally spit in a cup and sent it to Anne uh, at 23 and Me. And it's very interesting how the, uh, the granularity of information is starting to refine and refine as more and more people are doing this and more and more, uh, uh, you know, uh, sequencing is being matched, I, I am increasingly narrowing in on probably at least where my ancestors were 20,000 years ago. <laughs> That's not exactly going to get me a phone number somewhere, but it's a start. Um, and it's an exciting one and it's, I think, very thematic to what we're talking about in the data frame and a bit of the mystical as well. Um, so with that, I'd like to bring up both Thomas Goetz, the uh, executive editor of Wired Magazine, and Anne Wojcicki, the founder of 23 and Me. Welcome. All right. I actually have some, uh, I, I've been at Wired for 10 years, and I have some of John Battelle's original issues of Wired. He, has his, he would meticulously tape his business card on all his issues, so <laughs> I still have those. And yeah. um, I'm really thrilled to talk to you, because uh, four years ago, we, about a little more than four years ago, we started talking about um, this crazy startup that you were going to um, create uh, to give people the radical notion, give people a look at their DNA. And right. uh, it's been four amazing years. Yeah, it's... Um so, so a little background as to why we started the company. Um, I had a background of investing in healthcare companies on Wall Street. And um, after 10 years, I really just started to realize that the, the, all the money and the innovation, um, it wasn't really hitting the endpoints that I would have wanted it to hit. And that fundamentally, we live in a healthcare system that I don't really want to be part of. And I think all of you who've ever had to be in the hospital can relate to this, that it's really just not set up the way we would want. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that you as the consumer are not really part of the equation. Um, you're not paying the bills. I mean, you pay part of it, but your insurance company negotiates for you. Um, your physician makes a lot of decisions for you. But, but you as the consumer, you don't really have a voice in, in healthcare. And so the whole fundamental idea of 23andMe was how can, how can we create almost like a consumer revolution where we can all get together and use our data, get our medical records, use our genetics, and fundamentally change how we are approaching healthcare as also change the way we are doing research and the drug discovery process. So it was really about how do I enlighten individuals, how do I empower them to come together and, and really radically try to change healthcare. And you guys have been working along the, uh, the Moore's Law of Genetics. I mean, when you started, it was $1,000 yeah. for 500,000 pieces of data, right? I, it's, it's been amazing, actually, how the technology's evolved. So it started out at $1,000, half a million SNPs, so little data points. Um, we're now $99 plus a subscription for a million data points. But la a couple weeks ago, we actually announced an exome sequencing product where for $1,000, you'll be able to get essentially 50 times more data than when we originally launched. Um, so it'll be 50, 000, um, 50, 500, sorry, 50 million uh, data points um, and for $1,000. So sequencing has just really come down in price, and it's going to be um, an exciting new world for everybody. So the, and with every little one of those 50 million um, bits of information, you're, you're giving people the opportunity to, to actually learn about themselves. And, and the other part of the equation that you guys are so um, good at and so rigorous about are the surveys. Mm -hmm. so, so it's not just getting the data, it's combining it with 
people's um, individual circumstances and stuff right. like that. Right. So, so f again, going back to sort of why we fundamentally started this is that we felt that there is the opportunity to engage everybody um, to let the, any individual take action on their health as well as participate in research. Um, and again, it's, it's not just participating in research so that you're not part of it, but research that's gonna be meaningful for you. So for instance, we had somebody, a friend, came and said, you know, wow, I had sarcoma. Um, I would love to be able to do something. I wanna know how it's gonna influence my kids. So um, as a friend, I donated um, 1,000 kits to him, and we started a sarcoma community, and we now have 600 individuals with sarcoma. And you know, the, the physicians were working with Memorial Sloan Kettering and Dana-Farber, they've been astounded because for them, they probably get, you know, a dozen, you know, 50 maybe sarcoma patients that they're going to see in a year. We have 600 in a short time frame. So the ability suddenly for these people to come together, share information, they all have their genetic data, we can start doing genetic studies about why are some people responding to chemo, some people are not responding. Was there an underlying genetic cause as to why some people got the disease to begin with? So. My frustration of, you know, from the Wall Street side of, of, you know, these drug companies not necessarily doing the things that I as a consumer wanted. And most importantly, I want to know, am I at risk for something? And if I, if I am, can I do something to prevent it? As well as if I'm going to take a drug, is it going to work on me or am I going to have an adverse event? And, you know, the thing that, that, that constantly we're challenged with, um, genetics is all about, um, you know, what you're at risk for. And the only way I can know how to prevent a disease is, is if I know what I'm at risk for. And then I need to know what to do to try to prevent it. But nobody in the healthcare system now makes money off prevention. And so I- It's all I, treatment. I, exactly. So I wrestle with this all the time. If I can prevent, I can tell you if you're high risk for type 2 diabetes. But if I prevent type 2 diabetes in you, who's going to make money? Like the only group I know right now that would make money is Kaiser. So, but, you know, J&J &J is one of our investors. I wrestle this all the time. Like, how are they going to make money if I don't have you have type 2 diabetes? But if you do have diabetes, there's lots of ways that we're going to make money. Um, right, and that's the, I mean, that's the challenge with, with kind of a, the novelty of genetic data right. um, introducing into the healthcare system is, is it's just, um, you know, people don't know what to do with it in many ways. Not even, the, I mean, oftentimes the, the doctors don't know what to do with it. The insurers don't know what to do with it. I mean, you're, you're injecting a a really disruptive pool of data into, these, into this environment. Right, and that's exactly one thing that we are, we're working extensively on is that a lot of people don't know about genetic data, especially physicians. So a huge mission for the company is, is education. Um, it's part of the reason why we have, um, we've put together a whole series of videos called Genetics 101, where we try to educate people about what, what are genome-wide association studies, what's genetics, what is, you know, genetic ancestry. Um, and we spend a lot of time, almost everyone on our research team does customer service calls. Uh, we do a lot of in-person events. So we spend a lot of time trying to educate individuals. And more and more, um, we recognize that people are showing up in their physician's office. Um, we don't want to put a burden on the physician, so we're trying to create material so that if an individual walks in and says, I'm a carrier for factor five, and thus at high risk for blood clots, that the physician can know what to do and knows what the latest literature is. So there is a lot of incredibly meaningful information um, that we're returning to people. And we get customer testimonials every day. You know, we got one yesterday um, from, you know, president of a company who said, I'd had, um, you know, severe arthritis in my life. I haven't been able to play volleyball uh, with my children. I haven't been able to golf or play tennis. And 23andMe told me I was high risk for celiac disease. So I just decided to cut out gluten. And, um, and lo and behold, the arthritis has gone. He's suddenly able to do all the activities with his children. And obviously, it turns out that he um, likely has a gluten sensitivity with celiac. So, so our hope really is how are, we, how are we able to partner with a consumer? How can we partner with a physician and create better care for everybody and also really with a focus on prevention? How can I really help you take charge of your own life and, and say, if there's things that you're at risk for, how can we try to prevent those? Right. And I, I guess that's... Uh, one of the most important pieces of education that you, you offer people is helping them understand that, that their DNA, their genes, are not their fate. I mean, right. it's, it's, it's this interplay with their environment. It's, this, uh, it's the genetic information with the, the phenotypic information, what they do, they, what they eat, all that stuff. Yeah. So even, even as a child, I was always fascinated with sort of, you know, uh, nature versus nurture. And um, the thing that's, that's inspiring for me is that it's neither nor. It's not nature. It's not nurture. It's a combination of both. And to me, that gives all of us the potential 
of potentially modifying our environment so that we can decrease the risk if we're high risk for something. So if you're born with a genetic predisposition for something, are there things that you can do? So, you know, for instance, my husband is, is high risk for Parkinson's disease. And as a result, we try to, um, you know, he started drinking coffee um, because that's associated with potentially decreasing risk of Parkinson's. Um, we exercise a lot more. We eat better. Um, we're significantly more aware of our health. And I think that's one of the types of examples. And we're, we're starting to pull our customers and we're finding that people find they're at high risk for something and they are starting to do something. Getting it in black and white is a meaningful change for them. Where it, inspires them to take charge of their, of their health. So, so um, you mentioned Sergey and his, his risk for Parkinson's, and you guys actually have a, a quite robust and large project on Parkinson's disease with the Michael J. Fox Foundation. We do, um, and, and Parkinson, Parkinson's was our first disease community that we launched. Um, and obviously it's very personal to us, um, and it was part of the, you know, a, a bunch of reasons why we launched it. Michael J. Fox is a fabulous foundation, which makes the partnership great. Um, but Parkinson's is not the disease, you know, this is Web 2.0, um, it's not the disease that you would necessarily go after. Um, these are individuals who have a disease where they can't necessarily be online. There, a lot of people are over 65, not necessarily using the web and social media every day. Um, so it wasn't the ideal cohort. And that said, we launched the program and within three weeks we had 2,000 people sign up. We now have about 6,000 individuals um, with it. And what's spectacular is that uh, my husband has this uh, variation called LERC2. We have now the largest cohort in the world of LERC2 individuals. So it's a very rare, it's one in 10,000 individuals actually has this. So we have you know, well over 200, um, actually maybe more now, individuals with this. Um, but what's also really interesting is we have a lot of these individuals who have the LERC2 variation, putting them at high risk, but they're over 65 and they don't have the disease. So, so they have a risk, but they haven't actually, they have a, like a 50% risk of getting the disease, but they don't, haven't gotten it. Exactly. It's, a, it's roughly 50-50 odds of developing the disease. So they could, they're past the age when they would normally have the disease, and they don't have it. So why? Was it something in their environment? Is there a modifying gene? Um, and what's really exciting, and what's one of the things that we're, um, we're announcing today, is that um, through, the, through the research, it's the first time that consumers, by coming together, having participant-driven research, we've been able to identify something called a gene called SGK1 that looks like it's a modifier and protective against LERC2. Um, we have now launched a collaboration with Scripps where we're actually exploring the biology of this and exploring is this druggable. So for me, personally, it's incredibly rewarding that one, this might actually impact my family at some point, but two, the community has been so successful that in such a short time frame, we found something that could be a modifier and could eventually, there could be enough biology work and chemistry work that work that comes out that it leads to a druggable target. Right. So, so it's incredibly exciting for us that it's really the first time that a participant-driven cohort has, has you know, yielded something that is going to lead into you know, further biology and potentially into the clinic. So, so just to go through the chain here, because I think it's, it so doesn't, so if you guys aren't, aren't um, geeking out on genetics, so you understand kind of the, the thing. You have, so you have 125,000 um, users at, at uh, 23andMe, right. and, and 6,000 of them um, are in this Parkinson's cohort, right. um, and some significant uh, number of, actually those 6,000 all have the LERC2 mm -hmm. Um, uh, uh, mutation, right? Correct. And then uh, you, which is largest pot, pot of that, that um, group of people ever, right. or any place. So among that group, you've been able to isolate people who have this mutation, but not the disease. Correct. And then inside them, you've been able to identify another uh, gene yes. that makes them somehow not get the disease. Correct. And that's huge because... And it's huge because... Um, how, you know, we have the Parkinson's cohort where it's easy to say if you have Parkinson's, you come to the community, but finding people who have a variation, it's only, again, it's, it's one in 10,000 people who have the LERC2 variation um, who are asymptomatic is a little bit like a needle in a haystack because those are not part of the 6,000 Parkinson's community. Those are part of the 125,000, so the 100,000, uh, 120,000 individuals who do not have the disease. So they just happen to randomly come into our database. So that's, that's one of the huge powers of having a huge data set is we can start to identify individuals who have very rare variants um, but don't have the disease. And normally, most research, they're just going after people with the disease. 
So, and you found this out in two years, which is the scale that, that normal research takes just to kind of drum up a few, a few um, uh, people in their cohort and, and maybe get towards publication. Yeah, so, so it actually came, um, it, we even found it earlier. We just finally, we found it, um, and we didn't really know how significant it was. And I started um, talking to a couple academics um, and, and they were just, their, their jaws dropped. Like they were, they were so astounded. I can't believe you found a modifier. Um, so it's one of the areas when we met with Scripps and they were super eager. Um, they have an outstanding Parkinson's researcher, Phil Legrasso, um, who just jumped on the idea and Michael J. Fox is funding the research on it to see is this a potential druggable target. So it's really, um, you know, we didn't, we didn't even recognize that this was, you know, something, yeah. that this was as unique as it is, and it's something that's really caught the attention now of pharma because we can find these rare individuals so quickly, and previous, there's no other way to identify them. Um, one of the areas that I'm also super interested in, and again, looking at this crowd, something that we're all really at risk for is Alzheimer's. But 25% you know, of you in this room are carrying a genetic variant, making you at much higher risk for, for, sorry, for Alzheimer's, making you at much higher risk for Alzheimer's. But clearly there must be things that we can do. So we do actually have a significant cohort of individuals over 80 who have the high risk variant, but do not have the disease. So, so it gives us all hope that even though 25% of us in this room are going to be at risk for Alzheimer's, there are people over 80 who are cognitively 100% intact. So there's something we can do. And it's really up to all of us in the room of saying, like, I'm not afraid. I want to take charge. We can do something about research. We can do something about our health. We need to just understand it. And the challenge of healthcare has always been these fiefdoms of, you know, pharma company owning data and academics owning data, and nobody wants to share because you all get your grant money based off having your own little data set. But that's what we can disrupt. You know, we can all come together and say, I own my data. And that's the brilliant loophole that we can all fall through. And that's why this whole system works, is that the consumer has never been empowered. But we all have that potential to own our data and to take charge and actually say, I don't want to necessarily just wait for pharma to come up with something for Parkinson's or for Alzheimer's. I want to do something. And we're all at risk for something. We all have, you know, we all know our family histories. We all know there's something out there, but we want to change it. And yeah. I think trying to get over, that's what the, the, the brilliant thing, we find it so enlightening for people to say, we're actually proactively being part of this and that your data is actually incredibly meaningful and powerful. Well, it really is the vanguard of medicine because not only are you creating science and creating new insights, but you're also able to figure out how to change your diet. I mean, it becomes, yeah. it's, very, it's very immediate and yet it also has this great um, broad implications. So. Exactly, and that's what's, um, there was a study that came out for people who are genetically high risk for type 2 diabetes, when they found that they actually did change their diet, they were no longer at high risk anymore. So, so it, it, gave, it gave potential that, or they were no longer likely or developing type 2 diabetes. So it gives me the potential that you really can potentially change your diet or change your exercise habits, or there might be things like, uh, you know, wearing sunglasses for macular degeneration, which causes blindness. There's all kinds of things that we can potentially start to do. And all of us would rather prevent the disease than have it effectively treated. And Rajiski, thank you so much. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thanks man. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Great story. Turns out I also have a, a, a relative with Parkinson's. So go 23andMe, that's all I can say. Um,